General Thomas M. Dyke has retired. The story we are about to bring you concerns the individual courage of men under the most dire of circumstances. Their bravery, tenacity, and physical strength brought them through what some might consider the impossible. It is a story of the USS Flyer. In October 1943, the USS Flyer was commissioned at New London, Connecticut. And headed for the Pacific to join the submarine forces in their battle against Japanese sea power. Flyer's skipper was Commander John Daniel Crowley of Springfield, Massachusetts. Executive officer, Lieutenant Jim Liddell, was a former outstanding football player at Northwestern University. His hometown was Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Quartermaster Third Class Russo of East Boston, Massachusetts, was later to prove himself an outstanding and heroic individual, along with his shipmate, motor machinist mate Third Class Miller, a youth from Vancouver, Washington. Very pretty. Thanks. I got him in the mail at Midway. That's my girl, the other's my dog. Oh, well, thanks for telling me. But I can still tell the difference, you know. <laughs> I haven't been away from the States that long. What is the latest scuttlebutt, Russell? I hear we're going to the South China Seas, then back to Australia when we wind up the patrol. Any chance of seeing action? Well, I don't think we're going on a pleasure cruise. Is this your first war patrol, kid? Yeah. I know something? <laughs> I'm scared. Uh, what's there to be scared of? We've got a good ship, a great crew, and the best skipper and exec on the whole submarine force. Yeah, I guess you're right. But I'll let you in on a little secret. What? I'm scared, too. A little on edge, skipper? Yeah. I hate to go home with an empty bag on our first patrol. Uh, me too. Be pretty rough facing the boys of the officers club when we get to Fremantle. I can't understand what happened to that convoy. That contact from the plane should be in this area somewhere. I feel like I did on my first big date at the academy. How's that, Captain? I got stood up. <laughs> Captain, contact on radar. Bearing 090. Range 30,000 yards. Very well. Go ahead, Frank. Got us a course to get us about 15 miles ahead of them. Looks like my date's gonna show up after all. Plowing ahead at flank speed, the flyer moved in close to the Japanese convoy and slipped beneath the surface, making ready for her opening night curtain in the big Pacific theater. Now remember, honey, be sure and find yourself a nice home. In position, the flyer was about to make her debut. Let's get her set up. Stand by. With all the poise of a finished performer, she let go a bow spread of four torpedoes. Her initial attack scored direct hits on a large freighter. Fire two. Fire two. And a merchant tanker. Then, defying the oncoming patrol craft, she continued her aggressive assault by swinging her stern into position and firing a full spread, most of the torpedoes finding their way to a target. Narrowly escaping disaster from the constant depth charges, she slipped away, leaving four large merchant ships sinking and two others damaged. The debut was a success. Flyer was now a fighting lady of the submarine force. <laughs> Let's say this calls for a celebration. No bread pudding for two weeks. <laughs> Early in July 1944, the Flyer put into a base at Fremantle, Western Australia. Several of her crew received awards for achieving outstanding success on a maiden war patrol. Commander Crowley received the Navy Cross. Having tasted success, the men of the flyer promised to do even better as she headed for a second war patrol off the coast of Indochina. Making surface transit through the Balabac Strait between Borneo and the Philippines, Commander Crowley doubled the watch topside, anticipating enemy anti-submarine patrols in these restricted areas. Mara 
an island to the port. Battle back dead ahead. It was overcast, no moon, an ideal night for slipping through undetected. The watch strained to spot patrol vessels in this area as the flyer moved ahead at a speed of 18 knots. Then it happened. The flyer struck a mine. A blast of compressed air saturated with fuel oil came rushing up through the conning tower hatch, confirming that both the inner and outer hulls had been ruptured. All hands in the below deck spaces were trapped. In less than 30 seconds after the blast, the flyer dove beneath the waves, taking all hands with her who were not on the bridge or in the conning tower. A total of 69 men. Commander Crowley was pinned to the bridge and carried down at least 50 feet before he was able to free himself. You okay, sir? Yeah. We better strike out for that isle to the north. It's less likely to be occupied by the Japanese. I'll stick by you, sir, just in case. No. Oh, every man get there as best he can. Don't worry, Jim. I'll make it. Aye, aye, sir. Seventeen hours later, Captain Crowley and Jim Liddell reached the beach. They had ridden partway in style on a palm tree. They found Russo waiting for them. He had swum 12 miles without a life jacket or any kind of flotation gear. When's the last, last time you saw Miller? Just before dawn. I tried to stick with him, but he got a cramp, said he wanted to float for a while. Doesn't look like any Pacific paradise. What island is it, do you know? I think it's Managula. It was occupied by Filipinos. Well, let's hope it isn't the tourist season. Four more survivors, Tremaine, Baumgart, Howell, and Ensign Jacobson, had also caught a floating palm tree and succeeded in reaching the beach at Mandaguli Island. You guys placed third. It wouldn't have made it if it hadn't been for a palm trunk. Any sign of Miller? No, sir. We paddled around for a while looking for him, but I'm afraid that... Jim, you and Russo look around the island for fresh water and food. The rest of you stay here with me. We'll build a lean to all these palm leaves, protect ourselves with broiling sun. Come on, Russo. Let's bring over the bacon. The first day's search proved hopeless. No fresh water or food. The island was a dense mass of jungle. A few drained coconuts that had drifted ashore were cleaned of meat by the ants that infested the area. any food or water, but we found something much better. Miller! Miller! Boy, am I glad to see you. Don't know what you're so happy about, Captain. Just another mouth to feed. Sit down. Of the 14 men who got off the flyer, six never reached land. The survivors determined to keep up each other's morale. Exhausted from their weary day, they collapsed in the lean-to, hoping for a brighter tomorrow. Your foot took quite a beating, sir. Yeah. I gashed it on the coral reefs coming into shore. How you feeling, Junior? I was hoping it was a nightmare. It was. Let's search this area thoroughly. There must be food and water somewhere. Wake up that big halfback. We're gonna need some weight to back up the line. 
Wake up, sir. The men continued their struggle for survival. Their pace slowed down by thirst and hunger. The second day, still no solution in sight. Although the tropical sun was almost unbearable by day, their greatest enemy was the cold of night, accentuated by their sunburned bodies. The third day without food or water, the men grew weaker, their hopes of survival fading. As they reached the eastern end of the atoll, they saw a new hope, another island about six miles away to the east. What I remember of our intelligence report that should be Bugzook Island. Well, it doesn't look as desolate as this place. We gotta make a try for it. It's our only hope. We're all pretty weak, sir. Even in a slack tide, it's a long, rough swim. You uh, think we could build some kind of a raft? I saw some driftwood down the beach. I'm not much of a carpenter, but... Well, what are we standing around here for? A well, slack tide will be in in a few hours. Let's go. Well, that's the end of the driftwood. Don't think it'll hold all eight of us. The Captain and Miller can ride and the rest of us can hang on the after end and kick with our feet, can't we, sir? We'll all take turns. Well, Miller, looks like you and I take first watch on the bridge. Yes, sir. We'd better take it easy on the main engine. They look pretty sad to me. All ahead, plank. Two days later, the weary men moved in on Bug Souk Island. They had spent the two previous nights on inner eating islands, Bayan and Gabon, but neither had provided the food and water they needed. Suddenly, they became aware of approaching aircraft. Looked like a Zero, sir, had a meatball on her side. Well, I don't think we were spotted. Maybe our luck's changing. Let's hope so. Come on, we can't relax now. If we do, it might be for the last time. At this point, maybe that's the best idea. Come on, Junior, you can make it. Look. Think we could be held by the enemy? It's possible. We might be walking into a trap. We'd better not approach it right away. Let's watch it till dark. All right, boys. the Japanese invaders. We did not expect Americans. You're a guerrilla? Bugzook Bolo Battalion. I saw you come ashore, but was not sure you weren't Japanese. Are there any Japanese on the island? Yes, but not many no more. Only snipers. We kill most of them. How about your men? Any casualties? Only sore trigger fingers. Where are the rest of your group? Our camp is about five miles north of here. I'll take you in morning. Tonight you rest. Uh, can you get us any food and drink? We've been without for five days. I have coconuts. Wait. The 
caught some fish last night. You need strength to make it to camp. How long have you been on Bugzook? Only three days. We came from Palawan, looking for you. For us? Yes. Had report of submarine sinking in this area. Have been looking for survivors. Do you have any means of communication at the camp? No. We have small radio on Palawan, but it won't work. Maybe you'll fix it. Good. How? Here's your chance to work with the radio. I'll do my best, sir. It's going to be kind of tough getting to the camp. None of us have shoes. After what you've been through, be thankful you have feet. I guess that is the better way to look at it. Rise and shine, you tender feet. We're going for a little hike. How much further? Only about one more mile. You want to rest for a while? No, no, let's keep going. What are they going to do when we get to camp? I don't know, Junior. Maybe they'll take us on an orientation tour of the island. On foot? What else? Where are we going to get a cab this time of day? Come on, Junior. Don't give up now. We're on the home stretch. At 1800, they reached the camp being greeted by a group of six more guerrillas from the Bug Soup Bolo Battalion. They would rest for the night and start out by boat for Palawan in the morning. The next day, they shoved off for Palawan. Four days later, they arrived at Sir John Brook Point and started for the camp. After a few hours' work, Howell, chief radar technician, was successful in repairing the radio set and began the attempt to contact Commander Submarine Southwest Pacific in Australia. You know, I never did find out what your name is. Just call me Mike. My name is too hard for you to say in Filipino. Okay, Mike. Thanks for everything. Don't thank me yet. I've still got to get you back to American base. If he makes contact, the codebook we have may have been changed. Say, how are we going to get out to the sub if they do show up? We have a man guarding our boat at the northern tip of the island. He'll take you out. How far is this boat? About six miles. My aching feet. I got them, sir. Commander Crowley notified Commander Submarine Southwest Pacific of the situation. He requested a submarine to rendezvous with them five miles off Sir John Brook Point, Palawan. Captain Crowley was told to stand by for further orders. No offense to your island, Mike, but I sure would like to get off. I don't blame you. So would we. Well, if we do make a rendezvous, can't you come with us? No. We are the home guard now. I hate to sound corny, but you sure are a great bunch of guys. You are corny. Got to get you off before you eat up all the fish and rice. <laughs> rendezvous. Your requested position. 2331 August. Good. That gives us eight hours. We've got six miles of heavy jungle to go through. We better get started. We'll get there before dark, have a few hours leeway. Let's go. The group started out for the northern tip of the island, led by their guide Mike and two other gorillas. <laughs> Sir, you've got to stop and rest for a while. No, Jim, forget it. I'm okay. Oh, you're going to get those feet fixed. We'll rest a while. I'll fix your foot caps. Yeah, we'll never make it on time. 
We'll make it, sir. And you're going to be with us. I've heard of people giving you the shirt off their back, but this is the first time I've ever seen it. Thanks, Mike. We've only got a few hours left. How much further is it? About three miles. We've got to hurry. Well, let's go. the survivors reached a small craft that was to take them to their rendezvous with the submarine Red Fin and were ready to give their prearranged all-clear signal to the sub. Wait. Looks like trouble. The Japanese patrol boat. We can't risk showing the light now. Right where the Red Fin should be. Looks like they know our plan. If they did, they'd have more than that out there. We'll shove off and try to contact the sub by radio. You'd better hurry. Mike, I can't tell you how much we appreciate it. Thank you. Good luck. Hello, Red Pin. Hello, Red Pin. This is Flyer Group. This is Flyer Group. Over. Hello, Red Fin. Hello, Red Fin. This is Flyer Group. This is Flyer Group. Over. I can't figure out why they don't answer, sir. I'm sure the set's working. Maybe they aren't sure it's us. They can't risk the chance the Japanese didn't pick up our first message. Who is the skipper of the Red Fin, Captain? Cy Austin. He and I were classmates at the Academy. Let me have that set, Howell. Maybe he'll uh, recognize my voice. My Bonnie lies over the ocean. My Bonnie lies over the sea. Sign I used to sing in a barbershop quartet. My Bonnie lies over the ocean. My Bonnie lies over the sea. Bring back, bring back, oh, bring back my Bonnie to me. Bring back, bring back, oh, bring back my Bonnie to me. Oh, bring back my Bonnie to me. To me. Okay, Jack, you've convinced me, and you still can't sing that last note right. Hello, Cy! Cy! Cy, we're at Rendezvous Point. Stand by. We'll be with you. <laughs> ah, I never thought my singing voice would come in that handy. It's a good thing you didn't take any singing lessons after you left the Academy, sir. We'd be sitting out here for the duration. <laughs> <laughs> be back in a moment with our special guest. We're very fortunate to have with us Captain John D. Crowley, the Flyer's commanding officer. Jack, the sudden and unexpected loss of your ship was a tragic event. I wish we had time to eulogize every man of the fine crew who went down in her. When you found yourselves in the water, did you head for the nearest land? No. We knew the Japanese held an island about eight miles away, so we chose one four miles further. We were in the water 17 hours. I'm sure I'd never have made a swim of 12 miles without a life jacket. Of course, some of the boys didn't make it. But you'd be surprised how far you can swim if you have to. You've had one of the most remarkable experiences I've ever heard of, and it's been most interesting to have you tell us about it. Thank you very much. Please be with us again for another true story of the silent service. Take your long and off the line Through the deep blue underneath the ocean We'll control the ocean's wide Come down, down underneath the sea Take the course for past the world In the future's yet to be that we're safe, as long as there's a 
Underneath the sea